Yep. Good morning, everyone. This is Matt Murphy at Wooden Boat Magazine, and I'm here with Eric J. Dolan. Eric, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, and we're here today to talk about hurricanes. Uh, Eric is the author of numerous maritime histories, including Leviathan, um, uh, Black Flags, Blue Waters, A History of Pirates, Brilliant Beacons, A History of American Lighthouses, and uh, Furious Sky, his most recent book, deals with the 500-year history of hurricanes in America. And um, we'll open with a little anecdote. The, um, the photo you see here on, on my, my right um, is a 210 class sloop in Marblehead, Massachusetts after Hurricane Carroll in 1954. And uh, incredibly, the, the uh, forecasting back then was so uncertain. And, um, and the, the residents of Marblehead and surrounding towns went to bed that night thinking this hurricane was, was going to uh, peel off into the Atlantic around Hatteras. And it accelerated overnight and turned north. And, um, and, and people woke up to it, a dire forecast that, um, uh, among others, it, it drove ashore this beautiful Alden Ketch Mohawk, also in Marblehead. And, and this is a, a scene from Dorchester, Massachusetts, a, a, a launch that's been split right down the middle. Mm. And here's the, the Old North Church in, um, in Boston, with the, the steeple toppling, uh, being tipped over. Um, these photos are by Leslie Jones, who was a, a Boston Herald photographer at the time. And he shot a lot of, um, of sailboat racing and, um, and sailboat scenes around Marblehead and was was everywhere then. Uh, here's another scene from Dorchester. Uh, so, so just incredible. And, and so Eric is here to talk today and um, uh, about his book, but also to tell us a little about the, um, the evolution of the science of forecasting hurricanes and, and the uncertainty of it that remains today. Mm -hmm. um, so Eric, could you tell us a little bit about how you, you came to A Furious Sky? And I'll bring the, the cover up here now. Okay, um, yeah. I, uh, I didn't know, I just, I thought you wanted to mention that uh, if people are concerned about the the way that oh, the image thanks. looks, that the, the connection, you might want to mention that. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for reminding me of that, Eric. <laughs> uh, we, um, I'm, I'm here at the Wooden Boat Office today, and we have a lightning uh, quick connection, which unfortunately I keep getting kicked off of. And so I'm on a lesser connection, and I see we have a nice audience developed here. And if um, if somebody <laughs> would mind just chiming in and telling me if you're you're at least hearing okay, and and perhaps seeing okay, um, uh, but and we'll we'll do our best. Um, yeah, and, but but we'll we'll stand by for a comment, and, and thank you for that. But in the um, anyway, I could yeah, I can tell I can talk about yeah. how the book came about. I mean, yeah. this is my fourteenth book, and and normally I come up with the topics, and there's a good reason for that because if you have to work for the better part of two years on a project, you better like what you're working on and be excited about the. Uh, uh, the project. But actually for this book, it was quite different. Uh, if people remember back in 2017, that was a year that almost broke the records in terms of hurricanes. And in a couple of instances, it did. That was the year of Harvey, Maria, uh, Harvey, Irma, and Maria that uh, all combined uh, damaged enough to generate costs of $265 billion a year, making it the worst hurricane season on record in terms of damages. And so at the, towards the end of that year, or right after it had sort of wrapped up, uh, my editor at uh, W.W. Norton and Live Right and the head of the sales reached out to my literary agent saying that, uh, you know, we think that a book on the history of hurricanes would be something that Her Eric could tackle because I was known for writing books that span centuries and synthesize a lot of information into a narrative arc. And so, uh, they asked if I was interested, and my agent sent me an email saying, are you interested in writing this book? And I didn't initially say yes, because I didn't know much about hurricanes at all. So I went off for about a month or so, and I read a bunch of books on hurricanes and articles. I watched a bunch of documentaries on the Weather Channel and uh, PBS and other places about hurricanes, and I decided that it would be a fascinating book 
to write and one that I would like to write. So that's how the book was was born. It, it came from different direction than normal, but it was a lot of fun writing it. And I learned a lot about hurricanes. <laughs> Good. And I should mention too that you you live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, the, the scene of uh, several of those photos I showed, which yes. is particularly susceptible to, to hurricanes, uh, yeah. to northern storms. Yeah, not just, yeah, right. Absolutely. Not just hurricanes. In fact, uh, Marblehead's history is much more marred by uh, nor'easters that have come down the coast. Uh, we've had just in the last couple of years, some terrific nor'easters that have flooded lower lying areas of Marblehead, caused a lot of basements to be filled with salt water <laughs> and uh, destroyed some of the local restaurants or at least parts of them. So uh, yes, Marblehead is no stranger to uh, major storms, including hurricanes. And I had the depressing task, uh, the other day I gave a talk about the book to a group called Sustainable Marblehead, which are people in Marblehead who are concerned about environmental issues. And one of the questions of course was, what is gonna happen in Marblehead or in New England in general with respect to hurricanes? And although nobody knows for sure, uh, there is a landfall of a hurricane, usually about once every 10 years in New England. And uh, so certainly I would expect in my lifetime, we are gonna have at least a couple more hurricanes that make it all the way north to New England. And because of climate change, warming waters, different trajectories of major storms, uh, we might very well have another hurricane like Carol or even worse, the hurricane of 1938, which was a category three that, that didn't hit directly into uh, Massachusetts, uh, but, but could. You up in Maine are a little bit out of the way, but hurricanes have made it up to Maine. And well, we, might we all have a preparation plan with our, our boats. And yeah. Although it seems to me that a lot of them miss Maine and go to Nova Scotia. Um, yeah, anecdotal for me, but is that is that true? No, that's true. I mean, once they get that far north, if there is a Bermuda high at all, or just the way that the the winds are circulating in the northern Atlantic, uh, most storms at that level get sort of dragged over to the to the east and towards Nova Scotia or towards Greenland or towards uh, northern Europe. So it is rather rare, but even more important is once you get further north. Uh, the water gets colder and that <clears throat> helps put a break on hurricanes because they derive a lot of their strength from, <clears throat> excuse me, they derive a lot of their strength from the moisture that's coming off the ocean. And as it condenses, it releases a latent heat of condensation, which fuels the storm. So if you're very far north and your waters are very cold, it's going to help put a break on the hurricane's strength, but that can be overcome when the hurricanes are moving very fast. Like Hurricane Dorian, for example, which I end my book with, even though it didn't really affect the United States that much, other than clipping uh, uh, the uh, Cape Hatteras in North Carolina in 2019, when it sailed off into the North Atlantic, even though it went over colder water, it was such a powerful hurricane that by the time it reached Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, it knocked out power for 400,000 people. And the hurricane of 1938 had significant damage in Vermont and New Hampshire because it was moving so fast. So uh, hurricanes, unfortunately, we're going to have to deal with them from now until eternity. And a lot of the research shows that there's a good likelihood that the hurricanes in the future in a warmer world are going to be worse than those of the past. And <clears throat> now jumping back 500 years, <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you uh, in the early chapters of your book, you, and, and I didn't realize this, but the, the, um, uh, it was a, a hurricane that, that really pivoted the, uh, the, the history of Florida and, and um, in North America in general, and, and um, it, right. it made space for Spanish settlement there. Uh, could you tell us about that? Right. Yeah. Well, as everybody probably knows, in the 1500s and even the late 1400s, Spain basically took control in its eyes of the Western Hemisphere. And there was actually a papal degree, decree in uh, uh, 1493 that gave Spain control over the entire hemisphere, essentially, for settlement purposes, with the exception of a little part of eastern Brazil. So Spain started... Uh, destroying local cultures, Incan and Mayan cultures, Aztec cultures, and they took over these very precious gold and silver mines that they found there. 
So what happened is the new world was the uh, super highway for money for uh, Spain. And uh, they didn't like it when anybody else tried to invade their domain. So in the mid 1500s, France was trying to establish some colonies in Florida to uh, allow the Huguenots who were being persecuted in Catholic France to find another place to live. So Spain was already over in the Western Hemisphere and France uh, tried to make a settlement in the early 1560s right about Jacksonville, Florida. Spain assumed that they were going there only to create a launching point to attack Spanish treasure ships that were heading back to Spain. But they uh, misread what was really happening. Spain was actually just trying to establish a colony for Huguenot refugees. But King Philip II of Spain didn't believe that. So he sent a fleet over in uh, 1564 at the same time that the Fran France was sending over another fleet to replenish the settlers there. So essentially what happened is in the summer of 1564, this Spanish fleet and the French fleet started to tangle. The, the Spanish fleet set up shop in what later became St. Augustine, Florida. The French fleet was further north in Jacksonville, Florida. And the French decided they were going to oust the Spanish. And Jean Rabot, which was the leader of the French uh, forces, took 600 men and multiple ships and sailed south to St. Augustine, hopefully to attack Pedro Menendez and his Spanish troops who were on shore. But before he could launch the attack, a hurricane roared in, sent the French fleet further south, and they crashed into the shallows off Cape Canaveral. Now, Pedro Menendez assumed with the strength of this storm and the direction of the winds that, or he surmised that uh, uh, Rabot and his men probably crashed and that Fort Caroline, the fort that the French had established in Jacksonville, would be unprotected. So Menendez, in the height of the hurricane, got 400 of his men and slogged north many miles, attacked the fort, mercilessly killed about 130 of the Frenchmen who were in the fort, and sank one of their ships that was still there. And then Menendez said, hey, you know what? I'm afraid that the remnants of Rabot's fleet, if they come north, they're going to attack St. Augustine. So he quickly marched back south, and he found uh, more than 200 Frenchmen. More than half of them had died during the crash, but 200 of them were on shore, and Menendez and his men found them. And they killed almost all of them after they had surrendered, put down their weapons, and had their hands tied behind their back. So uh, one, one lesson of history that's very disturbing is that deep hatreds between peoples have been around since time immemorial. And the Spanish and the French, there was no love lost and they basically slaughtered most of uh, the Frenchmen. And for that reason, that's when uh, France really, uh, I mean, Spain really gained its stranglehold over Florida. And just think what would have happened if the French fleet had been successful and had run the Spanish out of Florida. Instead of being a Spanish colony, essentially, for a couple of hundred years, it would have been a French colony. And who knows, things might have been very different for the nascent American colonies because if France controlled Canada and they controlled Florida in the Southwest, maybe they would have met in the middle and taken over British colonial America. Who knows, you can't rewrite history, but it is fascinating how when you read about history, that small changes, just one individual not being around or one event not taking place could have changed the whole trajectory of our history. And what a brief storm, one brief- One storm, storm. yeah. Hours long storm, wow. Yeah, and then uh, jumping ahead from that, Eric, uh, another 400 years, um, I uh, wasn't aware of the, um, the, the deep impacts and uh, significance of the Galveston hurricane of 1900, which you treat yeah. in some depth. Yeah, the Galveston hurricane is sort of the granddaddy or grandmother of all hurricanes because in the end it ended up killing at least 6,000 people, perhaps as many as eight or 12,000 people. Uh, the reason we don't know is because uh, back then a lot of tourists used to go down to Galveston in the summer and records were not as good. But essentially the reason that it sticks in people's minds in part is because of the death toll, but the searing story that came out of it 
uh, of this local meteorologist, or actually he's part of the, he was part of the Weather Bureau, the Federal Weather Bureau, a guy named Isaac Klein, he looked at the historical record and assumed that a major hurricane would never hit Galveston, which was booming at the time in the late uh, 1800s. But his understanding of meteorology of hurricanes, just like his fellow meteorologists, was missing a couple of key elements, including the impact of storm surge, the actual impact of shallow waters. And, and also, he wasn't a very good historian because he didn't look back far enough into the past. There had been a number of hurricanes that had clobbered Galveston from the 1830s on. And in fact, a few people in the 1840s and 1850s and 60s had written articles where they basically said, sometime in the future, Galveston is going to be destroyed by a hurricane. But Klein was unaware of those or he, or he ignored those reports. And he basically had convinced the people in Galveston that it was unlikely that a West Indian hurricane would really strike head on in Galveston. But then in early September of 1900, a major hurricane made its way into the Gulf Coast and right up and hit Galveston s s dead on. And uh, it just obliterated the entire city. And as I noted, killed many, many people and there are a number of tragic stories associated with the hurricane. And what often happens after a hurricane hits an area, people all of a sudden are given motivation to do something to protect themselves from the next time a disaster might strike. Of course, they did that after Hurricane Katrina with mixed results, I think. But uh, after the hurricane of Galveston, uh, they finally decided to build a seawall around Galveston that was 17 feet high and about 16 feet deep. And that seawall proved its worth because 1915, uh, Galveston was hit by another major hurricane about the same strength as the Galveston hurricane of 1900. And although uh, people died, it was a very small number. And even though most of the city was flooded, houses were not totally destroyed. And I have to add that not only did Galveston add this seawall, but they also literally raised the entire city about 16 feet by putting houses and sub and rail lines and uh, all sorts of things, jacking them up and then pumping in hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of metric tons of sand from offshore to create new land so that the new Galveston was about 16 to 18 feet higher than the old Galveston. I've never been to Galveston. I hope to go. In fact, one of the frustrations of COVID, of many frustrations and, and horrible things, is it, it totally killed my book tour. One of the things I enjoy most after I write a book is going to different places to talk. And originally, my book was supposed to come out on June 1st, the beginning of hurricane season. But because of COVID, my publisher put it off till August of 2020. And I can still remember the emails they wrote me. They said, well, by August, we'll be past COVID and you can go on your book tour. Ha, huh, that didn't happen. But one of the places I was scheduled to go speak was going to be Galveston or Houston. Uh, I hope to make it there again one day. And if anybody is watching from that area, uh, this probably won't come as a surprise, but the National Weather Service has done uh, analyses of areas that are particular, particularly high concern. And of course, the Gulf Coast remains an area of particularly high concern for hurricane impacts. And the Galveston area is of a special concern because of how it's just out there on the Gulf, even though it's higher and protected by the seawall. When you have a major hurricane coming in, it's going to cause destruction no matter where it goes, whether it's the Gulf Coast, Florida, the Lower East Coast, or here in New England. Is this seawall still standing in its uh, pretty yeah. much its original form? Yeah, no, I'm sure they fixed it a lot over the years and they extended it over the years. It's sort of like the wall. A lot of people might be familiar with the uh, Lake Okeechobee hurricane of uh, 1928, which really clobbered West Palm Beach, but did an even worse uh, number on the uh, the migrant farm communities that ringed Lake Okeechobee. And after that, the government came in and built a huge dike that is both cement and earthen to keep Lake Okeechobee from, uh, you know, during stormy conditions or extremely rainy conditions from overtopping and destroying the nearby uh, communities. So there are a number of places, Corpus Christi is another place 
they had a number of severe hurricanes and the town uh, fathers uh, came together in the early part of the 20th century. And there is a a break wall or a, a, a wall around parts of Corpus Christi. Here in the Northeast where we are, after the hurricane of 1938, uh, the town or the city of New Bedford built their, um, I don't know what you call it, now I'm forgetting what they call it. It's not a seawall, it's a, a, something that they can close, sort of a barrier uh, to the ocean. And they have those in Holland for different reasons. But uh, after Hurricane Sandy, which I know we're gonna talk about a little bit later, there have been studies that have talked about putting uh, you know, barriers out in New York Harbor or other places to keep the devastating storm surge from uh, destroying parts of the city. Very expensive, these engineering fixes, but if they're done well, they work. And I'll just add one other thing. After Hurricane Katrina, which everybody knows about, devastating hurricane, the most expensive hurricane in American history, $125 billion, after that, the Army Corps of Engineers ad admitted or studies showed that the earlier dike system and levee system was improperly built. So they spent billions and billions of dollars shoring up the levees, building new walls, building a new pumping system. And it was very depressing when a study came out about two years ago that showed that uh, the fixes that they made and all those billions of dollars that they spent might have been for naught to some extent because those massive walls and levees were sinking into the uh, relatively unstable ground. So they no longer are giving New Orleans the protection that they were claimed to be giving New Orleans. And if another category three storm like uh, Hurricane Katrina smashes into New Orleans, there are going to be problems again. So, uh, you know, human-made engineering solutions only work if they're done uh, very well. Yeah. Uh, I recall, I don't have the photo here, but another photo from your book showing high watermark in Providence, Rhode Island during the- Oh Island. yeah. Um, I think you noted that two thirds of the city was under 10 feet of water. Yeah, it was amazing. The pictures back then and the descriptions. I went to college at, at Brown and we were up on the hill and I wasn't, I didn't even pay attention to hurricanes back then. As I said, almost all my books are on topics I don't know a lot about before I start working on them. And I never saw that marker. I wish I had, but there are a couple of markers down near the river that show how high not only the hurricane of 1938 went, but the Great Gale of 1815, uh, which is just a hurricane by another name, got quite high, but it was beaten out by uh, the hurricane in 1938. And as uh, everybody knows, who knows the geography of the coast, part of the problem is if a hurricane hits Narragansett Bay head on, all that mound of water and the waves that get pushed up through Narragansett Bay, they're getting pushed into a narrower, narrower and narrower space, and then finally up the Providence River, so that's why it created such horrific conditions where most of the city was inundated. Well, it, 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 the, the, that graphic of, of 10 feet of water um, uh, and then transporting that to an island like the Abacos and the, the hurricane that hit there a few years ago. Right. just makes one realize just how, how terrifying that must have been to, to suddenly be at sea, essentially. Oh, I, I, I cannot imagine it. Uh, Hurricane Dorian, the one you're mentioning, uh, just destroyed Abaco. I mean, destroyed parts of the Bahamas. Uh, a lot of these islands down in the Caribbean are only a couple of feet or maybe tens of feet above sea level. And of course, we have the example of the, the Labor Day hurricane of 1935, which smashed into the Florida Keys. And the Keys are just a couple of feet above sea level and often aren't more than a half a mile wide. And they're just sand spits essentially coral and sand spits and uh, they were devastated killing hundreds of veterans and just wiping away a, a railroad line and causing major devastation i'm not trying to get people nervous i mean there are things you can do to protect against hurricanes but one of the best things unfortunately it's hard to uh, go back and do this over again but is better planning and fewer houses and fewer structures right at sea level or in major floodplain areas but unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, we Americans, along with people I think around the world, love coastal property. We love living next to the ocean. And living next to the ocean, it's a, it can be a wild place. 
And, uh, you know, here in Marblehead, for example, I'm about a quarter mile away, a little less from the ocean. So I don't think a hurricane's ever going to hit us. But there are some houses in Marblehead that are quite low. They're often, there are also quite a few that are 20 or 30 feet high on rock bluffs. And, uh, but during nor'easters or during hurricanes, some of those houses that are quite high have been pelted with uh, rocks and small boulders. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it can be a dangerous and a beautiful place to live right on the edge of the ocean. And you need to be smart about uh, what you're doing. Oh, my, it's a beautiful place to watch storms. I and mean, those waves have <laughs> a little bit of energy on those bluff shores. Uh, yeah. So, so quickly. Uh, and I would think that um, also our understanding of hurricanes um, uh, is a, a big part of the, the management process. And, and that has evolved um, uh, tremendously over the past century or so. Um, you tell the story of um, uh, William Redfield and James Espy, who... Um, yeah, that's uh, James Espy. Okay. Yeah. James. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th that was one of the most fun things to write about in the book because the history of science, you know, it sounds like it could be dry, but it's often quite exciting. And uh, William Redfield was a guy who lived in uh, Cromwell, Middleton, Connecticut in the early 1800s. He, as a young boy, he was fascinated by science and he loved reading. And uh, he was actually all alone. His family had moved out to Ohio and left him behind to work with a, a saddle maker to apprentice. But he was insatiably curious. And fortunately for him, there was a medical doctor who lived nearby who had a large library and used to let uh, William read the books. So he grew up, he ran a store for a while. And then one day in 1821, he had a very sad task. He was traveling by horse and buggy, basically, uh, from uh, Middleton, Connecticut, uh, up to, uh, oh, now I totally spaced on the town. Uh, oh, Stock, Stock, Stockbridge, uh, Massachusetts. And Middleton is like right here. Stockbridge is up into, actually, it's alternative on this camera, but up into the west. So as he traveled, there was a hurricane that, that passed by a couple of months earlier, just a couple of weeks earlier, and it had downed a lot of trees. And William Redfield was a very curious man. He took a note of his surroundings. And what he noticed is that right around his hometown, all the trees were knocked down with their crowns facing to the northwest. But as he traveled north and to the west, he started to see the trees were knocked down and their crowns are facing to the southeast up in Stockbridge. And he couldn't figure out why this is. And he started interviewing people along the way and found out that at the same time, around nine in the evening, the winds around his hometown were heading towards the, uh, the northwest, but the winds around Stockbridge, Massachusetts were heading towards the southeast. How could such powerful winds be heading in exactly the opposite direction at the same time, just 70 miles away from each other. And he came to the only logical conclusion there was that this hurricane was a big circular or whirlwind storm. And he didn't tell anybody about his research, his findings yet, because he did what he always did, which is to gather information. And for 10 years, as he became a successful businessman, he gathered tons of information, observations from other hurricanes. And he concluded that hurricanes were these whirlwinds. And he was on a steamboat, actually one of the ones that he owned. And there was a professor from Yale, a guy named Olmsted, and they shook up conversation. Olmsted was a meteorologist or a scientist, and he had proposed a theory about hail formation. And Redfield was fascinated by it. So he asked some questions. And Olmsted suddenly realized that this guy knew a lot about weather. And uh, Redfield decided to tell him about his theory of hurricanes. And Olmsted thought it was fantastic. You have to publish this. He didn't want to at first, but Olmsted agreed to work with him. So he published this uh, very detailed paper that basically argued that hurricanes are massive circular storms. Uh, and on the right-hand side of the storm where it's traveling, the winds will be greater because you have to add the forward movement to the wind speed. On the left-hand side, they'll be less because you have to subtract the forward-moving wind speed. And uh, this was momentous in the field of hurricane meteorology. However, uh, James Espy, the guy down in the lower left there, was a very well-known meteorologist. He didn't like the idea of this amateur 
uh, coming up with his own theory, especially because the theory opposed his theory. Espy is the one who basically discovered that hurricanes are massive heat engines, and as the warm, moist air rises off the ocean, it condenses, forms clouds, and in the process, latent heat of condensation is released, and that gives the power or fuel to the hurricane. So Espy is the first person to realize that, and he deserves a lot of credit for doing so. But he thought because that rising air creates a vacuum in the center, essentially, and nature abhors a vacuum, he assumed that the winds came in like a, uh, a the spokes on a tire, that the winds from all points of the compass came rushing straight into the center of the hurricane and then went up through the center. Well, that was totally different than what Redfield said, a circular storm. And it turns out they were both a little right and both a little wrong because neither of them knew about the Coriolis effect. But for about a decade or more, this great storm controversy were on the side of Redfield, but then what really clinched it and sort of rounded out our understanding of hurricane uh, behavior was when um, uh, William Farrell came by and he added uh, his understanding of the Coriolis effect on the impact of winds and basically showed that when the hurricane is rotating like this in the northern hemisphere, every time it moves, there's a force, uh, the Coriolis effect, that's sort of pushing it in towards the center. So in effect, what the hurricane does is it's not, it do doesn't go in a circular pattern. It goes in a spiraling pattern that sort of swirls into the center. And when you add up Redfield's, Espy's, and Farrell's uh, contributions, you get the basic outline of what a uh, hurricane is and how it operates. But there's still a lot more to learn about hurricanes, and we're still learning more about them uh, today. So it's an ongoing process, but uh, that was just a fascinating story to me because you've got this arrogant guy, Espy, on the one hand, you've got an amateur scientist, which as history tells you, many of our greatest inventions and discoveries and breakthroughs came from amateurs, not the experts. Because uh, there's sometimes there's nothing to beat somebody who's passionately committed to trying to solve a problem, even though they may not have the requisite degree to do so. Now, the, the categorization of hurricanes has become a, a household term. You note in your book, um, a, a fin the financial meltdown described as a category five storm. Um, right. That has an interesting history too, and in, in, in some roots in a, a Texas storm, another Galveston storm in the 1920s, I think. And um, a, a Galveston storm. Simpson scale. No, it didn't. Oh, oh, okay. You're no, okay. We're but saying it's it's Robert, Robert, the, yeah, you know, you, you get it right. It's Corpus, it's Corpus Christi to some extent. It, uh -huh. it only has an impact because here, here you see in this picture, on your when you're looking at it on your left, the guy in the bow tie is Robert Simpson, mm -hmm. who became a very famous, well-respected uh, meteorologist in the Weather Bureau, the precursor to the National Weather Service. He was greatly impacted as a youth by the Corpus Christi hurricane in the early 1920s that uh, destroyed uh, many parts of Corpus Christi. And he actually watched the storm from, I think it was the third or fourth floor of the courthouse, one of the most strong, one of the strongest buildings in the city at the time. And it really seared itself into his memory, but it didn't have a direct impact on the the Sapphire Simpson scale, other than it probably helped launch his interest in meteorology. And he ultimately became the head meteorologist and the person that was, he was looking for a way to describe hurricanes a little bit better than just using adjectives like, you know, huge, uh, powerful, whatever. And then he heard about this, uh, th this, this system that Herbert Saphir who worked for the United Nations had come up with to categorize wind speeds in the Far East and in the Indian Ocean that impact uh, building structures on land. And he had five categories of wind speeds. And uh, he met Robert Simpson and Robert Simpson heard about his uh, categorization of wind speeds. And he goes, aha, 
this is what we need for hurricanes. We need a scale so people can have a shorthand way of categorizing a hurricane as it barrels towards them to know how serious it is. And that's where we came up with the Saffir Simpson uh, wind scale. It goes from category one up to category five, every category ascending in the uh, sustained wind speed at 33 feet above the surface of the earth. That's where they officially measure it for one minute of, of time. And that scale, I think, has been incredibly useful because people react to it. Unfortunately, people often assume that if it's category one, oh, you don't have much to worry about. But that's not the case. Category one hurricanes can be devastating, as we learned with Hurricane Harvey, which was barely a category one hurricane, when it parked itself over parts of Texas for the better part of two days and dumped more than 50 inches of rain on, uh, on Houston, depressing the crust of the earth in that area by almost an inch. And it dumped 60 inches of rain on Nederland, Texas, which is an all time record for any single storm. So that was just category one. Uh, but in general, as you, as you go up the category scale, they become more devastating, the winds are stronger. And uh, no, no matter where you are, category three, four or five, which are all major hurricanes is really bad news. Have you noted that the, that the scale have a tendency to create um, um, dangerous complacency? If, if the yeah, it, it can. Well, it's just amazing to me how many people don't pay attention to warnings, especially now that we have satellites and other ways of knowing that hurricanes are heading in your direction. Of course, hurricanes are unpredictable at the last moment. They could shift 30, 40, 50 miles from where they've been predicted just 6, 12 hours before. And uh, what happens a lot of times, unfortunately, is the chicken little theory. It's basically that if people are told that a hurricane is barreling towards them and then it misses them, they go, hey, you know, the weather forecasters were wrong last time, so why should we worry this time? And Hurricane Sandy had a little bit of that problem. Uh, but I would make a pitch right now, as somebody who used to work for the government and has a lot of respect for government employees, especially the National Weather Service, I didn't work for them, that if they're warning that your area is likely to be hit by a hurricane, you should listen to federal, state, and local officials and evacuate if necessary. I'm totally amazed and disturbed by the large number of people who not only stay behind right on the coast when a hurricane is coming ashore, but also have hurricane parties. Those are real things. Or go out right down to the water to take pictures or selfies or whatever. You know, hurricanes are serious things and you should try to get out of harm's way and do the best you can to hurricane proof your house, which can't be 100% but you can do a lot of things to keep your house from being uh, trashed. So yeah, people, Americans in general, I mean, people, we often don't react until there's a disaster. And uh, we often assume that an outcome is gonna be better than it actually is. Uh, so hurricanes are nothing to mess with. And if they forecast a hurricane coming towards Massachusetts, I'm certainly gonna pay attention and do everything I can to keep from getting in harm's way. Run for the hills. <laughs> yeah. um, now, um, it, and that, that risk you just described makes it all the more incredible that one of the, um, the great methodologies for studying hurricanes in recent years, and not so recent years, is to fly airplanes into them. <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems counterintuitive, but actually one of the guys who is a pilot on these hurricane hunter planes I have a quote in the book which says the most dangerous part of his day is driving to the airfield and climbing up the stairs to get in his plane. Because you have to keep in mind that these pilots and these planes are well-designed, highly skilled pilots. And uh, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, have a treacherous situation flying into a hurricane. You are going through the wall of a massive wind storm. And the worst thing that can happen is uh, that there's a severe updraft or downdraft. But after thousands of hurricane hunter flights, going all the way back to the, 18, uh, the 1950s, there are only four known instances of these hurricane hunter planes uh, going down. And uh, 
no, five instances, sorry. And I think four of them are in the Pacific dealing with typhoons, which is just hurricanes by another name. There's one, Hurricane Janet, uh, in the Atlantic where a plane was lost. So it's, uh, it's more dangerous, far more dangerous to drive on a highway than it is to go in a Hurricane Hunter flight. I've never been in one. Uh, maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll get to go. But uh, it's just amazing, these floating laboratories with all the technology that they have. And they really do us a tremendous service by providing land-based meteorologists with real-time data that they need to better estimate or predict how this hurricane is likely uh, to behave. Uh, is that um, that lack of risk you described? Um, because um, even though forecasting the paths of hurricanes is an unpredict is, is a difficult science, uh, is the um, a, a hurricane a, a snapshot of it a pretty predictable beast um, if you're you're going to move through it? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I mean, there there are there are some hurricane flights that are very smooth. Other times they get caught with updrafts and downdrafts. But I think after over time, yes, there are a lot of characteristics of a hurricane that are similar from one to the next. Mm -hmm. But they also have their own individual personality, and to some extent, they they are they each one is is different. Even if you could broadly describe it with the similar the same kind of terminology. They each have their own individual characteristics. And I don't think any people that fly into a hurricane intentionally take it lightly at all. They're performing yeah. the public service that has a certain amount of inherent uh, threat, but uh, they're highly trained and skilled and dedicated to uh, helping understand the hurricanes and thereby helping all the people on shore, but hurricanes are incredibly complex. I mean, we have these hurricane prediction model models or weather prediction models that have a huge number of equations and can be run millions of iterations to try to predict what's going to happen, not only with a hurricane, but with weather in general. But because of chaos theory, which I describe in the book, and because of our inability to capture at every moment all of the exact meteorological atmospheric elements that are at play. And even if we could capture all of them, to model them uh, accurately is virtually impossible. So we take a snapshot at one point, but at that snapshot of the wind speed, the moisture content, uh, steering winds, all these different things is off by just a little bit, but we use that snapshot to iterate into the future. Well, the iterated future from the weather prediction model is going to go in one direction, whereas reality is going to go in a slightly different direction. And after a couple of weeks, they can have no uh, similarity whatsoever. So that's why the people who are much smarter than I am and are trained as meteorologists and understand it at a very deep level, all of them pretty much agree that uh, further than about two weeks out, we're never going to get weather prediction models or weather predictions that are you know, very, very good. And certainly with a hurricane, which is the most monstrous storm of all, it's even harder. And that's why even to this day, we have predictions of where a hurricane's going to go and it goes in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared for uh, changes. And before we close out of this image, Eric, uh, which, which storm, is this uh, Sandy? That's no, that's uh, if I, that's Katrina. Katrina, the eye wall? Is that the eye wall? Yeah, that's, that's the eye wall of Katrina. And that's what's just amazing. Look how beautiful it is up above. The clear, uh, moisture-free air, and then beneath it is this cauldron. Uh, the eye walls have been described as these great white amphitheaters. Uh, I'm sure that everybody who goes in and sees one the first time or just sees a picture is in awe. But there's something so... Um, it's sort of like a, a split in your mind. Here's something so beautiful, so awesome, but down beneath, you know, it's dark and windy and things are getting destroyed. Uh, it's, it's just a, an interesting dichotomy. And um, of course, we use satellites now too to, um, right. to study. Satellites, they're, they're amazing. I mean, you know, <laughs> 
you know, I'm not a I'm not a scientist. I have an undergraduate biology degree, so I know a little bit about science. Or I'm not uh, I'm not totally uninitiated. But when I think of all the technology that we use just in our general life, but more so with weather forecasting, like these polar orbiting and geosynchronous satellites, it is absolutely amazing. Just think of how important to uh, boaters, uh, GPSs and radar and other things that help you uh, successfully navigate your way. And then look at these satellites, which are just beaming down massive amounts of information and essentially creating a situation in which we can never be totally surprised by any weather event. That, that, as I said, that still doesn't mean that it's not tricky predicting what's going to happen. But there's no way that a hurricane now in today's world with satellites can catch us completely off guard. But just go back a couple hundred years, people had almost no idea that uh, the next day a hurricane was going to visit them. And just think how horrific it must have been, how scary it must be to uh, people in the 1635 hurricane, which uh, destroyed parts of Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay Colony. You know, one day things look good. The next day, you know, you're running from your house. It's being inundated by water. Uh, so um, we, we, should be, we should be happy and thankful that we live in a time when we have the opportunity to know well in advance what's on its way. And uh, hopefully that gives us a leg up in dealing with it. Yeah, uh, a leg up indeed, but but still that uh, requires sound decision making and, and, um, and yeah. using that information properly. And and I'm reminded of, of this sad story during during Sandy, yeah. um, the uh, Bounty, HMS Bounty. Uh, uh, and yeah. we're not here to pass judgment, of course, but but this um, w was certainly a, um, a the, the sinking of this vessel was the result of a, a decision gone bad. Right. Uh, well, this replica, uh, which is a little bit larger than the original bounty that William Bly was kicked off of by uh, Christian Fletcher and forms the basis of that uh, story that we've read about and seen in the movies. Uh, the, the, the captain, Robin Walbridge, just made a decision that turned out to be a poor decision. Instead of staying in shore or in port as Hurricane Sandy was coming up the coast, and Hurricane Sandy was a monster of a storm, almost a thousand miles in diameter. He decided uh, to meet a commitment down in Florida, a charity event that they were supposed to be involved in on November 10th of uh, 2012, that they would head out to sea. And his plan was to go far out and uh, around Sandy on the uh, right side. But uh, in the midst of his voyage, he decided to change course and he thought that he could go to the west and get in between Sandy and the coast and use the winds that would be to his benefit to help drive him down to Florida but miss the brunt of the hurricane. And unfortunately, it was a poor calculation because soon this uh, wooden vessel, which uh, had a checkered history of uh, repairs and performance was facing a massive hurricane, not only winds, but huge waves. And ultimately it succumbed and Robin Walbridge died. His body was never recovered. And one of the, one of the crew, uh, Cla Claudine, Claudine Christian, Christian. Yeah. She, uh, she died as, as well. Uh, very, very, very sad. And there's a picture, a Coast Guard picture of the bounty sinking beneath the waves. I think it's about 14,000 feet of, of water beneath it right at that point. So it's a very, very uh, sad story. Uh, unfortunately, there are hundreds if not thousands of sad stories of people at sea making a decision that in hindsight they should have done something else. I am not a boater. I live in Marblehead. People are often amazed. How do you live in Marblehead and you don't own a boat? Well, I wasn't raised in that kind of family. I love boats. I've been on a number of them, but I don't own one. But uh, when I read these stories, and there are many, many stories, and I'm working on a book on privateering right now during the American Revolution, and I've been reading some stories about ships that were lost at sea during bad weather. It's just amazing to me, people like you and other people who get in boats, relatively small boats, 
and voluntarily go out into the ocean and thousands of miles. And it just, it's just very exciting. It's very exhilarating. But for a relative landlubber like myself, it's also a little bit scary. <laughs> Do I recall correctly, Eric, that you spent some time in Regina Maris, though? A mutual friend introduced us several years ago, I think, from that. Is, what's Re what's Regina Maris? Uh, um, a, a ship that sailed from Massachusetts. I, I might have that wrong. Our, our yeah. mutual no. friend Eric Hutchins had sailed in in Regina. Oh, and I thought no. that was your connection, but that's no. That's I just my connection to the ocean is more visceral and and biological. Growing mm -hmm. up on the shores of uh, Long Island Sound, I just loved the ocean. I loved reading about Jacques Cousteau. I wanted to be a biologist at one time. I got a scuba diving license. I didn't use use it very much, but I was very gung-ho. And then at one point, you could see over my shoulder, there are a couple of seashells over. If you could see over here, I've got cabinets full of shells. I was a very serious shell collector during my teens. And in fact, when I went to college, I wanted to be a malacologist, uh, somebody who studies seashells. And I worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic for a while. I worked in the mollusk department at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. So I had this biology background. I love the ocean. I still love reading about the ocean. Uh, and I love going into the ocean, but I'm just not a sailor. Uh, uh, the, the closest I became to a major sailing, it wasn't sailing, is I was a lecturer on the Queen Mary II in one of their crossings. So at least I got across the Atlantic on the water. But of course, the Queen Mary is nothing like a, a sailing vessel. <laughs> it's like a floating city, very different experience. Well, you and I were talking before we went live with this broadcast, and about um, yeah, I've read uh, several of your books, and and um, and really taken with the cinematic descriptions you make of um, of, of the sea and of events on the water. So um, you've you've obviously studied it very deeply, and and oh, yeah. able to uh, weave some some pretty hard facts into these these engaging descriptions. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, that's my goal. My goal is to write books that I'd like to read. I like stories. I like human interest stories. And uh, that's what I think draws readers in. But if you do it right, you can also add all the, you know, quote unquote, more academic stuff or the, the background context material so people can fully understand uh, the story. I did want to add just one thing in case anybody who's listening is interested. Uh, I do have a website. It's just my name, Eric J. Dolan, with uh, full name, D-O-L-I-N. And the reason I'm pointing it out is if you go there, you can read the introductory chapters to each of my books. And also, if you're interested in buying a signed copy, I can sell one through my website. But more than that, there are, there are little trailers. Uh, you might like the trailer for A Furious Sky. They're things that I put together using GarageBand and iMovie. But they're basically four to five minute movies that uh, talk about what's in the book. So anyway, if you're interested in learning more about me or my books or seeing those trailers, just go to the website. Great, well, thank you for that. Thanks for reminding us of that. And um, yeah. we'll close with this photo the, the, or this painting, this Winslow mm -hmm. Homer painting after the yeah. hurricane. Uh, and it's, um, I don't know if you have yeah. anything to say about but this, but it's its so evocative. Um, I love his work. Oh yeah, yeah. Winslow Homer is my, I think, he's not my favorite. He's one of my top three uh, favorite artists. I actually, yesterday on Facebook, on my professional Facebook page, I actually posted a uh, Winslow Homer image, one of his last images. But he just, uh, you know, Prouts Point, Maine, and just his ability to capture the moods of the ocean and uh, people fishing and, you know, on the Grand Banks is just amazing. And I saw this beautiful watercolor while I was working on the book. And, uh, he has another watercolor that I think precedes this chronologically, where that gentleman is in that boat out at sea, surrounded by ravenous sharks. So uh, right. <laughs> that didn't make it into the book. But yeah, Homer is a great, great artist. Wonderful. Do you know where this um, where this painting? I don't know. I, I think it was in the Bahamas. I I can't. I, I should have looked at it before it got on. I I don't know 100, percent but I'm, I, for some reason I want to say uh, Grand Bahama or near there. Uh, but but the painting itself, do you know where it hangs or what, what collection? Oh, no, I, I don't. You can find out quickly. Just oh. do a search online, Homer and uh, After the hurricane. Shipwreck, <laughs> yeah. shipwreck Dory. Okay, well, I'll see uh, if I can put that up in the uh, the comments, too. Um, and we, <laughs> Eric, there's a question here. Um, somebody is, is hoping that we can um, post a link to your website. And I will answer that question. 
unless you'd like to, and, and give a link to the website in the response. No, yeah, I'll just repeat. It's just it's just very simple. It's my name, www. My name's not www. www. Eric J. Dolan. It's E R I C J A Y D O L I N dot com. And that'll take you. But also, if you just do a search on my name, Eric Dolan or Eric J. Dolan, the, the results you'll see, the, the top results usually are parts of my, um, my website, like my events page or something like that. Great. Well, thank you. And Eric J. Dolan, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this has been thank, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you in person. Yeah, <laughs> likewise. You know, when the madness is over, we'll, we'll make that yes. happen. Okay, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, we're going to sign off now. And uh, watch the Wooden Boat Facebook page for announcement for um, next, um, next Friday, March 5th. Uh, yacht designer Chuck Payne is going to join me for a discussion of his, his newest creation, the Levant 15. And I'll have more on that soon, the, the timing and the, the content. And also, if you're looking for more video content, head on over to the Wooden Boat Store, um, woodenboatstore.com. And uh, the Wooden Boat School has been putting together a, a really nice video series. And, um, and it's been recently launched there. And, and uh, you can learn more at the site and, um, and subscribe to a year's worth of how-to instructional videos. Eric, thank you again. And, um, and we'll sign off now. All right, thank you, Matt.